Good morning and welcome to our second online talk organized by the NIO Research Project, funded by the National Research and Development Agency of Chile. This project is called Cyber Physical System for Smart Mining, Industrial Electronic 4.0 and Data Driven Process Control. And it is a collaborative research in electrical engineering in the areas of uh, control and power electronics. The project is led by the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, the Andres Bello University, and the University of Tauro, in collaboration with five international universities and six mining related companies. Today, we are pleased uh, to have Professor Michael Merlin as a guest with his presentation on the increasing role of power electronics as energy player in the modern electricity grids. Michael Merlin is a lecturer with the School of Engineering in the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. His research interests include design, control, and operation of modular multilever converters for medium and high voltage application. Michael, thank you very much for uh, accept our invitation. The microphone and the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Javier. It was, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here for this talk. Um, so, Alison, she asked Victoria to share my screen. Perfect. Um, yeah, so my talk will be essentially about uh, talking about the increasing role of power electronics as a major player in modern electricity grid. Uh, but first, I'll just do a, a very quick introduction about our research group here at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so the University of Edinburgh is, as you may know, located in Scotland, which is in no northern part of um, the UK, which means that we also are very well known, not only for the nice people there, but also for the very peculiar weather um, that uh, is very different compared to the one you may find in Chile or in Santiago. Um, but on the other hand, as you can see from this picture, not only do we have a lot of rain, but we also have a lot of wind, which means that Scotland is also at the forefront of renewable energy, namely the wind power, but also there is a big push for um, uh, wave and tidal uh, renewable generation. The University of Edinburgh has been founded quite a long time ago, uh, 1583, uh, and it's one of the biggest universities in the, in the English-speaking world. Um, there are many alumni from uh, this university. I will let the curious one go through back the slide if, if they want to. Uh, more specifically, we work within the School of Engineering, which is a, um, a school um, which uh, essentially brings together four disciplines, the electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and uh, civil engineering. Uh, and we are due to have essentially a new building very soon. We are located in the King's Buildings campus, which is just slightly south of the city center of Edinburgh. Um, more we, uh, closely to us, um, so we work within the Institute for Energy System, which is the largest in uh, research institute within the School of Engineering, with quite a lot of academic staff uh, and research uh, researchers within this group. We do a lot of research on renewable energy, um, both in, on, in terms of generation, energy storage, carbon capture, and power electronics, especially over the last few years, since essentially uh, Professor Stephen Finney, myself, and Dr. Poldras have joined at different points in time. Uh, but we are all essentially bringing a lot of power electronics focus within the Institute for Energy System. And since then, our essential research uh, group has been growing steadily with a, no a number of uh, researchers, all involved on different power electronics, whether it's on device device level or power converters, energy application, genera uh, energy gener generation, or, um, or electric machines. We have actually developed some uh, test capabilities within our lab. Um, for example, we have the double test uh, pulse test rig, which allows us to essentially test the uh, very high power devices. As you can see from this slide, it can go all the way to 2, K uh, 2 kilovolt and 1.5 kilo amp uh, and 150 degrees. And that allows to test um, the, the switching patterns of power electronics up to picoseconds um, uh, time scale. Which also means that we do a lot of work on advanced gate drive. For example, this is a, an example where instead of doing the classic um, simple step pulse on the gate of the power electronics, we can actually now modulate that in order to improve the performance and most likely, uh, most specifically, the switching losses and EMI generated by high power devices. We also look at uh, converter topologies, whether it's looking, for example, at a hybrid. 
converters with um, two two level converters one with normal silicon device and the other one with silicon carbide devices in order to um, to uh, to have a converter with uh, which generates very high um, quality power waveforms uh, with minimal uh, filtering um, passive filtering we actually proud ourselves into actually building the, the research that we do, not only because it's important to demonstrate our results in hardware, but also it, uh, it provides a very good opportunity to, uh, to talk with um, industrial partners to demonstrate our ability to deliver projects. Um, so we've got essentially a number of, um, of converters in the lab at the tens or hundreds of uh, KVA uh, level. That includes two-level inverters, uh, wide-band gap devices converters, but also multi uh, modular multi-level converters, as you can see being built in this picture. We also work together with industry. For example, in that case, we've been looking at doing some research on hybrid transformers for distribution networks and looking at how to, uh, to enhance the classic tra um, magnetic transformers into something a lot more flexible, which is the case with that company, Ionate Limited. And we work with a number of uh, both industrial and university partners throughout the world. But most importantly, why is power electronics tech um, having such a, a bigger and bigger space essentially in, uh, in the electrical uh, network? Well, first, because the electrical network is evolving in that sense. Traditionally, it was very centered around generation. Then we have a very clear transmission and a very clear uh, distribution and consumption but that picture is essentially changing with the fact that we have now more renewable energy which means that this is energy that we don't have as much control as we uh, we have with traditional um, energy vectors like uh, gas or coal but on the other hand this is the way forward because we know that we are in a climate emergency and we really need to move to more renewable type of generation especially if there is more and more within the grid, both in terms of distributed generation. So now that generation is not only just at the generation scale, but it can be found all the way at the bottom, but it can also be um, uh, through the increase of electric vehicles, the electrification of heat. Um, all that is, is putting a lot of constraint um, and burden on the, on the electricity network, which now sees power flows going in all directions. And in that sense, the only solution is essentially to have more flexibility in the system. And that flexibility, essentially, there are many solutions to that, but partially on my side, on our side, I'd say that Powertronics can actually bring a lot of risk, um, answers to those, those questions by the fact that Powertronics is a highly controllable um, system, which can essentially help to push powers in almost any directions, um, and it's controllable at will. Um, on the other hand, uh, the flexibility also opens up the question, which is what do we do with that? So power electronics, especially if we look at very high power, like in a high voltage direct current, has gone a long way to the point that nowadays we have essentially converters which are massively based on power electronics as opposed to more passive devices. And those, uh, those systems are highly complex, but on the other hand, extremely effective and quite power, power dense compared to all the solution in the past. Sorry, my mouse is um, a bit moody today. Um, so this is an example with the modular multi-level uh, convert, uh, converter, which can, for example, generate very clean AC and DC waveforms um, with a high number of SIM models uh, without requiring a lot of filtering, which also means that a lot more focus is, is uh, actually put on the valve hole. Um, we can do a lot of research. A lot of research has been done by our group and other groups in, uh, in the world in order to improve this formula by looking at how to do hybrid with uh, using IGBTs or thyristors in order to improve the power efficiency of these converters. You may end up with more complex um, topologies, but on the other hand, the efficiency can be drastically uh, improved, for example, 30% compared to the classic half bridge MMC in this particular case on top of achieving uh, other services, for example, DC side fault. Um, doing also doing all the work, like all the topologies, like the alt, uh, extended overlap alternate arm converter, um, which is essentially to minimize the number of C modules and devices in, inside the converter, um, and also minimizing the number of big passive de devices like inductors, uh, which in the case of the um, of the uh, MMC can actually quite be very large component um, that 
um, is always very tricky. That's one of the things I always tell to uh, students and collaborators is that small um, items on the electrical diagram can actually be very small, but in practice, they can actually translate to absolutely huge devices just because of the sheer physics behind it. Um, so trying to improve that formula by moving the inductors in different places, um, changing the way the whole topology is operated, we can actually minimize that by changing the number of, uh, of for example, inductors in that case, minimizing the number, the amount of capacity capacitors that we need inside, and still trying to keep the, uh, the power losses within a, a controllable and acceptable range. Um, so one thing that I usually say is that uh, power converters need to really go around like five points, which is like making sure that they are efficient, making sure that they are volume uh, or uh, power dense, uh, trying to uh, provide as much uh, operation and services as they can uh, within the operational limit which is given to them. And they need to essentially bring a certain level of reliability, especially when you compare that to, um, to traditional assets that you can find in electrical grid, which are traditionally very reliable. If you take, for example, a power transformer, um, it may have, a, in the traditional grid, it may have a, a lifespan, expected lifespan of 40, 50, sometimes extended to 60 years. Um, power electronics can't directly compete with that, but on the other hand, it needs to provide, uh, to, to be reliable for an extended period of time. Uh, so we can actually play with all these by uh, playing with different frequencies, making sure that we have redundant components, uh, improving the thermal management of the devices. Um, in terms of operation, we can put more ancillary devices, extending the mission profiles. Um, but all that essentially just at the end of the day, this is cost, 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 cost. Um, all that combined there and how much are the operators and the manufacturers uh, willing to pay for these particular services. So it's all a, a trade-off in that case. Um, so at the end, in, the, in terms of uh, the traditional converter in the power grid is essentially um, just trying to uh, schematize that, is essentially measuring the grid voltage and just pushing a, a fixed amount of power uh, through it, which is um, now a well-understood way of doing the control of an inverter, where it works really well, means that we can actually focus the, the converter, uh, make sure that the, 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 the power converter actually focuses on the power delivery. For example, if it's connected to um, uh, a photovoltaic or solar farm uh, or wind turbine, then it's actually trying to um, follow an MDBT, for example, a maximum point power tracking um, uh, mission where it's trying to extract the maximum amount of renewable energy out of that particular renewable uh, resource. Um, but on the other hand, it, it is kind of oblivious of what's happening essentially in the grid. It's essentially pushing the power that is being asked for, whether it's a set point or it's the coming from the uh, renewable energy controller. Uh, it means that if the grid is not willing to accept that power because the voltage is not at the right place, because the frequency is, is, is going up and down, depending on, on what's happening, especially in terms of the balance between the generation and the demand, uh, the converter may not be essentially be held there. And if we consider that, coming back to that earlier picture, uh, picture that I very <laughs> briefly showed earlier, um, not only do we add more and more power electronics in the system, we also have the, the effect that some of the traditional generation is now being taken offline, um, which means that a lot of generators, for example, are no longer present in the grid. And those generators, not only do they push energy, but they also provide a very important mission, uh, they actually fulfill a very important mission within the grid, which is to stabilize its frequency just by the fact that they are rota mechanical rotating machine. Um, and that actually helps a lot during an imbalance between the generation and the load. If there is an imbalance there, as much as the operators will try to change the um, power set point of the generator very quickly, they can't do that within less than a second, so let, let alone around a few seconds. Uh, and that difference in power is essentially being delivered by inertia of the, the inertia of the machine, which means that the energy is either speeding up or slowing down. Um, and if the, the grid frequency goes too high or too low, uh, it can have uh, catastrophic consequences uh, in terms of grid stability, in terms of operation and potentially damages to the network 
all, all the way down to the fact that the network can uh, actually just go down. We had an, uh, with usually nowadays, um, acoustic grids are so important that if there is a frequency event, it actually makes the headlines. We had, for example, in the UK two, uh, three years ago, uh, we actually had um, a, a partial blackout, which was actually generating um, uh, the result of a lightning strike um, somewhere uh, close to a power generator, which is a gas power generator. That gas power generator just essentially just disconnected because that's traditional way of, of dealing with it. Um, but that essentially generated a frequency event, which led later on to several other generators, including um, a wind farm, to disconnect. And that led to a massive deficit in power generation. All things essentially cascaded, and part of the UK essentially find itself in the dark. Not for very long. It took a good half an hour um, to reestablish um, most of the network, but that half an hour had dire consequences on many, many services and possibly lives as well. So it is very, very important to ensure the stability of the grid. Uh, but in that case, the power electronics in the way it's traditionally being used is not contributing to the grid inertia. So one thing we can do is essentially, uh, the other aspect is also faults. Fault is an inherent part of, of the grid. We don't hear about it, but if you do work directly with the grid, you know that fault is something which happens several times a day. Um, and in, in that case, most power electronics can actually quite be, can be quite weak against fault. For example, if you have a fault on the DC side in a voltage source converter, then a, a very large amount of power can be drawn from the AC side and feed to that, uh, that DC fault. So that's why the development of DC side fault blocking converters is actually very important in that sense. That those converters can be operated in such a way that they actually can prevent the fall, fall from happening in the first place. Um, this was essentially a test that we did all the way back, for example, um, with another research group at Imperial College, where we have essentially an actual hardware converter, which is operating normally. At one point, we actually throw a DC side fault, which is in that case is a proper short circuit on the DC bus. Um, and in that case, the converter just properly straight at first doesn't know that there is a fault because the fault detection um, um, algorithm by definition takes a little bit of time to detect that it's a fault because there can be a lot of false uh, positives. So you don't you won't really want to avoid that. But then at some points, the, uh, the converter, this, uh, the algorithm decides, no, this is a proper fault, stop the power operation. So in that case, at that point, the converter stops pushing active power and just, for example, revert into reactive power, which was the way we set up that particular experiment. During that period, the fault is present. The converter is just essentially acting as a statcom, providing reactive power to the AC grid, which can help with um, uh, voltage balancing uh, and, uh, and stability of the grid during that particular event. And then when the DC, when the DC fault is gone, the, de the converter detects that automatically and resume operation within a very short period of time. The thing which was actually quite um, uh, disarming or quite surprising with that particular um, uh, experiment was that it's actually happening so fast that if it wasn't for our measurement uh, equipment, we would almost detect the fact that the fault happened in the first place. So it just shows how versatile and controllable the power electronics can become nowadays. But another way we can actually just change the power converters or the way they operate is just slightly tweak the way they, they work. So now instead of just measuring the voltage of the grid in order to push the power that they want to do, uh, or they have been asked to, 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 to push, they actually now measure the grid state in order to adjust their power output. We can actually just make sure that they operate a bit like an um, inertial machine where they sense that the grid is now, is now slowing down. So they're actually going to provide extra power during that time, going slightly beyond their original mission. And in that case, we can actually make sure that the converter actually per, uh, participate in the grid inertia, which participate in the fact that the grid will become more stable. And that has been proven in a number of research that I highly recommend uh, you to check out. For example, synchroverter, grid, uh, grid following, grid, for, uh, grid forming, um, and virtual synchronous machine. But then the question comes like, well, yes, if the power electronics is providing extra power and therefore energy because it's power times time, so a certain amount of power over a certain amount of time, then where is that energy coming from? 
Well, in that case, it could come from many um, locations. It could be from what's on the other side of the DC bus, but then that kind of pushes the question to some uh, to somewhere else. And if that other side of the AGDC link is, for example, within the same AC network, that's not really helping in that sense because you're just taking energy from that particular network back to the same network. So that's not helping um, much in terms of um, providing inertia in, the, in that particular grid. If it's connected on the other side, on the other hand, to, for example, a wind farm, uh, it could be essentially tapping into the inertia of the rotating machines, which are the wind turbines. That's one way. Or another way could be that if there were some energy storage somewhere, and that energy storage could be either on the other side of the DC bus, or it could be stored inside the, um, uh, the converter. And that's something that our group has been looking at over the last few years. Another kind of question that I won't be covering today is also the fact that inertial machine also provide another type of service during fault, which is the provision of fault current. And that's something that power electronics is still struggling a lot today. Um, so when it comes to the, uh, the topic of energy storage, uh, that's something which has been very highly recommended by the national AGDC centers, which released a report uh, back in July 2021, so just one month ago. Um, and uh, they highlight the fact that the integration of energy storage inside AGDC is actually very much key. Um, and and uh, both because it is uh, essential, but also because it represents a massive opportunity for HVDC and power electronics converters and future grids to improve the operation of electricity networks. Um, but the thing is that where do we put that energy? Well, modular multi level converters are kind of nice in the sense that they do inherently have an energy storage device inside, which is the capacitor inside the C-module. On the other hand, that capacitor, which is actually the blue part in that picture, that capacitor is actually huge. And when you uh, look into the particular picture of how a um, MMC station looks like nowadays, actually those capacitors do take up quite a lot of space and not only space, but also a weight of that station. So imagine if that power station, uh, that um, uh, converter station is actually offshore on a platform, then that means the platform has to deal with a lot of weight. And that adds up very uh, a lot and century. The way we size those capacitors is essentially based on the on the energy profile, and we found out that there is actually very little um, that we can do with that. So some research has been done in that particular paper on trying to size um, those capacitors inside, and it's essentially linear to the amount of power going through the converter. So if you double the power, then you need to double the, the size of the capacitors. But all in all, those capacitors only amount to about 30 milliseconds of energy storage. So it's extremely little. It's essential for the operation of the converter, but it's not a lot in order to provide additional services like virtual inertia. So another way we could be doing that is by integrating batteries inside. Um, which is actually a very interesting topic, and that's what I will be spending most of the, the remaining time of that presentation. Um, so there's um, a lot of research which has been done into integrating batteries inside MMCs, so for example, that work from uh, in Oxford, um, where they've been looking at integrating the, the together the battery management system and the, and the MMC module control at the same time with, uh, with, with some level of success. And showing the fact that uh, the fact that they, they merge both the energy management system and the battery management system together, they can kind of improve the battery aging. The thing is that integrating energy storage in every single C model can actually be very costly, uh, very uh, challenging, um, not only in terms of uh, weight management and safety, but also because actually when you look at the amount of uh, power that um, virtual inertia needs to provide is actually not that much. We're not talking about doubling the amount of power that the converter needs to provide. It can be just an extra 30, 40, 50%, which is still a lot, um, which means that we don't actually need that much power. We do need quite a lot of energy, though. Um, so that energy, we don't need to transform all the sim modules into uh, battery sim modules, may, but we can actually use some of them then uh, poses the questions like how to make sure that the energy is coming from those models from the where the battery is located as opposed to the normal models where there's only a capacitor and therefore a very limited amount of energy available in, uh, inside. So those batteries could be integrated inside the, um, the, the same models either through, um, uh, 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 yeah, essentially through a, um, a bug converter or it could be some other type of, of topologies there. 
Um, but the thing is that this kind of topology requires the fact that you redesign the whole MMC from scratch. It could be an MMC or it could be a Statcom. They are the, both are kind of similar from the topology point of uh, uh, the, the research point of view. The implementation is different. Um, but both requires quite a lot of redesign, essentially, from the MMC converter station. And we know from the fact that um, ABDC uh, research and development is extremely expensive. And because reliability costs and many other aspects are paramount in those converters, they essentially just can't afford to change their uh, their uh, HVDC converter design every so often. Uh, that's not something they want. So one thing we can essentially do is essentially trying to look at how can we integrate energy storage to either an existing HVDC um, uh, uh, an existing um, um, HVDC station or to an existing design of an HVDC sta station. So one thing we could be doing is, for example, the topologies that we've been publishing recently, and we've published recently. So either we integrate that in parallel with the ARM inductors or we integrate that in parallel with the, uh, the sub part of the stack. So essentially the idea is that we provide partial uh, power rating um, within those topologies without requiring the, a massive change in terms of topology. You essentially add an energy storage part which interact with the existing MMC and you change, the main thing will be on the software side where you change the, the way the control system is achieved. Um, just conscious of time. So, um, so another way, as I said earlier, the provision of extra power does pushes the boundaries of the um, uh, boundaries of power electronics, so we can essentially play a lot of tricks in terms of the way the, the way the current is being circulated inside the converter in order to push the power capabilities of the converter beyond these traditional limits. And that has been shown to be quite effective in, uh, in some research. Uh, for example, if we allow the converter to go past its limit for a short period of time, we're talking about here a few seconds only, um, uh, that has been proven in the literature that actually that can help the grid transition during um, one of those very severe events. For example, in that particular case, there is nothing which can be done. The converter can, cannot push more than its normal one per unit power. Uh, and in that case, that frequency even just essentially leads to a big drop in um, uh, a big drop in the, um, in the frequency. But if we allow the converter to essentially just go past its, uh, its limit for a short period of time, then actually we can actually help the grid uh, not having a, uh, the, its frequency going down too much, uh, and yet the um, uh, in order to allow another solution to take over within that time scale. So on that, I think I'm bang on on the time. So I will essentially stop there. Thank you very much for your um, attention, and I will be turning my head to the questions essentially. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, for your very interesting presentation, you give us a very clear view of the importance of uh, power electronics in the present and future of electricity grids. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some questions from you from the from the audience. So the, the first question said, uh, "Why use hybrid power converter? It is a reduction in, modal in modality. Is it produce a real reduction in reliability, as you show, or not?" That's a that's a very interesting point. Um, the idea is that uh, looking at hybrid uh, um, hybrid uh, converters, the idea is that as much as the traditional MMC is extremely good and it's now becoming a quite established uh, topology and power training solution within at least HVDC and also now going all the way to uh, medium voltage application, for example, for drive. Um, the MMC is still limited in the sense that well the uh, when you compare that to traditional systems for the polar transformer, the MMC is still we, uh, is still more lossy. It still requires a lot of uh, volume, uh, and it can also be quite costly to uh, to build, as opposed to some other tradi um, traditional solutions, as I said, transformers uh, or variac, which maybe doesn't provide you as much services. But how much do you value the services compared to the cost of the converter or power electronics itself? So one one aspect of looking at hybrid topologies is whether it's uh, it's the external overlap AAC or the hybrid uh, with thyristors. The idea is trying to push that envelope 
um, of the power electronics even further by either improving the power efficiency, making sure that it can provide more services. So it's actually it's that like in looking at cost versus the cost opportunity of more services. So it's like, if you bring more services, maybe that will offset the cost. Or if you can bring down the cost, maybe you can actually afford those services on one hand. So that's kind of the idea behind those hybrid topologies, not only just for the sake of looking for new topologies and new type of research, is also really trying to push forward um, what power electronics can do for a particular cost in that case. And that, as I said, cost really includes everything inside uh, inside power electronics. I had that nice uh, picture there where, uh, okay, no. there. So it's just like really trying to, to have everything linked there. It's like, if you try to improve the efficiency, then that will impact the cost. If you improve the volume, it will impact the cost. If you impact the operation or the services that the power trains can provide, it will impact the cost. So it, as much as it all comes to the cost, and I, I'm not an economic person, so I can't tell you essentially how much it costs at the end of the day because it's very part, uh, project dependent. Um, but if we can help to, uh, to play with on the operation side, on the efficiency side, we know it's going to play with the cost at the end. It's very it's straightforward here. We have a lot of uh, variables mixing uh, in several, I mean, issues like cost efficiency. So it's, it's not so easy. Uh, we have a the second question uh, that said, what do you think is the main challenge for modular multilevel converter? Is it the faults, the cost, or other issue? Um, so modular power converters, the, the main uh, challenge is, or I say, I'll say the opportunities for improvements are first on efficiency. Uh, a typical uh, line commutative converter, which is the a, um, a very mature technology for AGDC, is usually efficient to the point of, for example, ninety-nine point five percent or even six percent. Um, that zero point one percent is actually very important when you think about the amount of power which goes through those those AGDC. We're talking about gigawatt of power, so zero point one percent is essentially just one megawatt of loss. It's not trivial, um, not only in terms of managing the, the heat losses, but also because of the of the uh, energy which is just lost um, through, uh, through that operation. Uh, the MMC in, its, in itself is only 99% efficient, which means that you already lost 0.5% just, just by using a converter, which, yes, can provide way many more services compared to the LCC, but on the other hand, at the cost of higher... Again, coming back to the same point, it's like, yes, you can have more services, but on the other hand, the cost is higher. So um, it, it really depends on the on the situation. What we see is that there is, as much as there is still a lot of LCC being built in the world for um, uh, most of the new um, AGDC project, there is also a lot of MMC. So it shows that the, the cost uh, opportunity associated to the services that the MMC can provide outweigh its own cost compared to other more traditional uh, solutions, but it's not always the case. So what we can do with the MSC, improve the efficiency, we can improve the volume, we can improve the weight, we can improve the reliability, because those converters, they need to operate for, well, traditionally in HVDC, we, we're talking about like at least 20, if not 30 years now of operation um, continuous. They need to carry on working. If they fail, um, then this is a massive power outage. This is a big point uh, uh, passage of power, which is just off. For, for the grid, so that's not something which is acceptable. Um, and they're just extremely costly to maintain as well. So as much as those HVC converters may have a maintenance maybe every year or every two years, sometimes if they are on a short platforms, you can't afford to do that every year. You might do that every five years. So how can you make sure to actually improve the, um, uh, the reliability of those converters? For example, in the MMC, one of the obvious solutions is to put more C modules so that if there is one C module failing, then you can use another one. But again, that's at the cost of having more C modules in the first place, which are not being used. Uh, so what do you do? Do you pay for them waiting for another C module to fail, or do you make the C module more uh, more reliable? It's kind of a trade-off there. The point of the research is to provide options so that at the end of the day, the people who decide for those projects can actually look at this. So I'm just looking again at that diagram there. I'm just trying to say, how can we improve the MMC? We can improve the MMC on the, on the efficiency, on reliability, on operation. That's something I've uh, uh, talked about towards the end of the presentation, where can we add actually, for example, grid forming or virtual synchronous machine capabilities into the MMC? 
the answer is yes, but how? Well, there is a lot of papers and uh, research which has been done there, but what now the, the question is, what are the costs associated with that? Is that at the end of the day, it's like, yes, we can provide virtual synchronous machine, but where's that energy coming from? So it's like, okay, we we can't get, for example, that energy from the other side of the AGC link, because as I said, it's, for example, link within the same AC network. So there is no point trying to pump energy there because you want to help that AC grid in the first place. Um, so you take it from an energy storage. Great. How do you integrate that energy storage? Do we do that on the, on the DC side? Maybe, but that also means that you need to have a whole new converter just being put there just for waiting for that energy. Do you put that inside the converter because it's kind of a nice opportunity to have all the power electronics to, um, to integrate with energy storage? Yes, but how do you achieve that? But now it's like, yeah, but if we put that in every single part of the converter, then that's going to be very expensive, very bulky and very prone to failures as well. So maybe we could do that in only a few C modules. Fine, but how do you make sure that the whole converter operation remains stable, even though it has a very hybrid topology with one part with energy storage, the other one doesn't? Um, so there is a lot of question there. Um, and Volume, I've already talked about that. So essentially, just was always referring to that diagram saying like, can we play, how to, can we improve the MMC? Play on volume operation, reliability, efficiency, efficiency all that concentrating into a cost opportunity. Thank you, Michael. Very clear answer. And we have several questions about inertia, so we we put it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one said, uh, as you said, inertia is a very important concept to control the frequency and the voltage of the system, but the new renewable uh, generation uh, do not have inertia. How the concept of virtual inertia is approached in electrical system when it comes from um, photovoltaic or wind uh, generation, for example, it is better to use the energy from, from storage or from uh, under generation of the wind farm or the TV plant. And which one uh, has more advantages to implement virtual energy? I mean, uh, TV plants or uh, wind, wind farms? That's actually a very important point. And that's, um, that's why it's kind of um, interesting to see. I mean, like, like anything in, in the knowledge of hu humankind, like, the more we move forward, the more we find that actually we, we less and less, um, as much as we become more specialized, we are less and less um, encapsulated into our own research, meaning that uh, now I can have like energy, yes, from, the, from my own batteries or from the PV, but now I need to integrate the, um, the design of the power electronics together with the PV or the, or the wind farm. So to answer kind of the question, the question is like, which one is best? I'll say, well, it, it will highly depends on the on the, the type of wind farm you, you're using, for example. If it's PV, imagine that you're already using the maximum power you can get from the sunlight at that particular point in time. There is nothing you can do. That You, you can only lower your power. There is You can't go higher. So one thing you can do is you can change your ma maximum power uh, point tracking to be slightly suboptimal so that it doesn't generate as much power as it can, so that when you need it, you, you can actually in increase your power output. On the other hand, it also means that this is a lost opportunity because this is energy that you're not capturing. It's the same as in, this is something which is not new. Traditional generation was already or is already doing that. When they generate a lot of steam from burning gas, burning coal, they always divert a little bit of steam out of the main turbine so that if they need to very rapidly um, ramp up the power, they just bring that steam back in. But on the other hand, that steam has been generated by burning gas or coal or, or from other means, and it's lost. The energy is lost. It might be recirculated in the system, but you always lose it at the end of the day. So one thing we can do with we can do the same thing with renewable, meaning that you can operate your renewable energy at a slightly suboptimal uh, operating point in order to have a little bit of oomph. Uh, extra power that you can push when you actually need that. With the kind of wind turbine, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword as well um, because, for example, you can you can like okay, but wind turbines they're rotating, so you can actually slow them down. But on the other hand, the way the wind turbines work is that they they capture power based on how, how fast they're rotating. So if you slow them down, it means that they will be less able to capture wind. You need to re-accelerate them afterwards. So it's kind of like, yes, you're taking energy, but it's not like a, virtuous, uh, a normal inertia machine where that energy is, is in the network and the network will push it back. You need to push it back 
even more because that uh, that wind farm is now not able to generate as much power as it was before. Um, so that's why that's the idea is that can we use other energy storage uh, device means battery and that's something for example we've got those big uh, a lot of uh, battery energy uh, system being implemented in the grid whether it's very well known like by, by Tesla in, in Australia but there is Toshiba, Itachi, uh, ABB they all have, have a pilot projects where they have battery being installed in the grid and that those batteries are great because they do provide almost immediate um, energy response but at quite a high cost because batteries are very uh, very costly um, uh, costly devices. It doesn't look like it for us because we well we've got it in our phone and uh, and it doesn't matter. But the amount of energy stored there is puny. This is this is really small amount of power. We're talking about watt hours. Whereas for the grid, we're talking about mega or gigawatt hours in order to get anything meaningful. Um, th that means essentially billions of those devices which needs to be connected in order to provide something useful. Uh, but it can be useful in the short term. So, for example, the battery energy storage could be very good, for example, by having, um, it's like there is a bit for, uh, I mentioned different scenarios. The, um, it's always the same thing. It's like you have a balance between the generation and the load. If the generation is going down, for example, because your wind is not blowing as much, there is a cloud going above your, uh, your solar farm, you can top that up with a little bit of energy storage in order to make sure that you're still managing your uh, your demand. Or imagine that your demand is, is just shooting up, but you can't increase your generation as much as you want, then you can top that up with um, uh, with battery energy storage, uh, which is embedded in your system. And when that balance is the other way, where you have more generation than, than demand, you can recharge. But that means a lot of strategy going on, not only on the economical market, that's the whole point of the energy market there, but it's, uh, but it's also um, management and strategy in the way the, the grid is designed in the first place. Because it's like, what's the cost opportunity of having batteries or energy storage waiting to be used and charged at certain point in time of the day, even though the forecasting of the month is getting pretty good nowadays, it's not perfect. And and we're seeing that uh, even though, for example, with um, climate change, we're seeing a lot more extreme events. Looks at what's happening in New York today. Looks at what's happening with uh, uh, in the US or any other part of uh, in the world everywhere. Uh, like large flooding, catastrophes, uh, of for, uh, forest fires. They do, you can't really predict those ones and they can have catastrophic um, impact on your grid. Uh, how do you recover from that? by having a more flexible grid, essentially. That's the, that's the whole aspect to that. Yeah, and I think it's very clear that, that someone has to pay for the grid coordination because, I mean, if you use uh, batteries, it's very costly, and if you uh, operate the, the plants under the maximum power point, you are losing energy, so someone has that, to that's pay. Part of I mean, that's, that's beyond, <laughs> this is like in the energy market where they try to provide, and that's something, for example, the. Uh, national grid here in the UK is actually thinking about putting a special market for this kind of virtual inertia uh, services where they will actually pay generators to have some margin available um, uh, for this kind of event because they know that these margin in the past was kind of hidden inside the inertia of the generators but now this is a separate services because it needs to be brought into the system and nobody is going to pay for that unless it's, it has a value to it. That's unfortunately the way um, the whole capitalist system works. It's like you need to provide the value for it, otherwise it's, it's not being used. And that's the same for HVDCs. Like you can have a converter sitting. Um, if you want the converters to provide an extra 30% power, what do you do? Do you actually design them to have 30% extra power, which is never used apart from those opportunities? Uh, those moments where, when you actually need that extra power, or do you actually just design them to be at 70% and sometimes you use them at 70% in order to get that extra 30%? It's part of, of the design of the network. Us engineers are essentially trying to find technical solutions for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have more questions about the virtual inertia. The, the next one said, 
If you use a capacitor energy for virtual inertia, they will discharge reducing the voltage. How this will affect the operation of the converter? Very good question. Uh, and that's exactly one of the, the, the tricky aspects. It's like, uh, when you look at, uh, um, at converters, uh, so uh, virtual inertia there, so some of the um, uh, some of the, the the questions there in this kind of uh, situation is like if you have um, the the energy going down in this uh, in the, you're right like if you if, if you use the energy of the capacitors the capacitor voltage will will go down so that's part of the control system so the one of the big aspect of power electronics um, research is not only just on the device aspect it's also a lot on the software namely the control system to be able to anticipate that. Um, when it happens and react to it in order to be like, okay, I know that the voltage is, is lower, so it means that I can't use that particular part of the system as much as I, I was doing before, but I can still provide it because of, uh, on the, the design of the pyrotronics, we make sure that we've got enough margin, but on the control system, we make sure that the control system can use the fact that that voltage is going down to not essentially um, reduce the capability of the converter. So it's always the same thing. For example, if we look at in classical MMC, if we have a stack of, uh, of similarities with a capacitor there, um, what we do is that we put enough capacitors, enough simulators, and enough voltage there, such that the, the stack needs to generate, uh, volt the voltage that the stack needs to generate is always less than the total amount of voltage that you have inside the stack. If that comes even too close, then we will have to curtail some of the operation. But as part of the design, on the other hand, how much overrating do we actually need in the converter? That's part of the research questions. From uh, Juan Sebastian, hmm. said, uh, what challenges related to virtual inertia do you consider when bidirectional power flow is considered? And he's talking about prosumer case. I mean, when, when a house or an industry can also inject power. Ah. Yes, this is, I mean, that's something I didn't touch during this presentation, but um, I, I mean, I, I did kind of hint at it at the very beginning, uh, but it's the fact that the grid is now, instead of being a very unidirectional uh, power flow going from generation, transmission, distribution, load, it's actually now kind of really merging everywhere. There's a lot of, you, you use the, the right word here, which is prosumer, um, where now the consumers can actually just generate their own electricity but they can actually more, do more than that. They can actually generate electricity, which can be used by their neighbors. Um, so the idea is like, how can you sell that energy to someone else? If you, you know that if you sell that directly to the grid, most likely you're going to get a very low return um, for money-wise uh, from that. Because the grid is not very uh, accustomed to having this power coming back. It's not very... Um, used to it and it's it's not convenient essentially for, for it because it's not part of the planning um, whereas if you can sell it to someone else then it might be advantageous if you sell it at 10p per kilowatt hour to your neighbor it's two times more than what the grid will buy you but it's still 30 percent less than what that neighbor would be paying the grid for it um, virtual inertia uh, in that sense we need to be able to deal with the fact that um, it's not only just um, a reduction in frequency in, in, the, in the AC grid is also to the all interconnected grids. Um, so if we're talking about an AC-DC converter, it could be the DC voltage slightly going down. And in that case, the converter needs to also to react to that by essentially drawing, for example, more power from the AC grid or from its own energy storage like batteries, as we were talking earlier. Um, so in that case, the concept of uh, virtual inertia is really much uh, I'll say a bi-directional uh, multi-definition term because it really needs to react to all these kind of scenarios where it's not only just the grid going down, the AC grid, it can be the DC grid or it can be the, um, uh, the local low, low network. And especially if we talk about converters being the gateway point to a microgrid, then in that case, the, the inertia of the microgrid is also of impact as well. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from Emmanuel, who said, uh, how about using a current source converter instead of voltage source converter? I believe it can further minimize components because it's a short problem. Uh, yes, I mean, so far the, the CSC, and for that I will mainly um, talk about, that, that's mostly referring to the line community converter. 
the line committed converters is the, the, the mature technology and it's still being used and commissioned nowadays in some of the latest uh, HVDC converter stations. But the problem is that the ACC, the LCC um, doesn't, you, you cannot control it to provide this kind of services, essentially. You can't use it to provide virtual inertia because it is very much of, um, it is very much um, a grid following type of converter. You can't do much on the on the control side. You can tweak a little bit. You can change its power set point, but um, but it's it's it still very much relies on the AC grid in order to ensure its own commutation of thyristors and all this. So yes, the reason it's still around and it's most likely going to stay around for a long time is because, as you said, um, it uses fewer devices, uh, power power electronic devices. Not it's not the case on the filter side, uh, but definitely fewer power electronic devices. Uh, it is more reliable, but on the other hand, it doesn't provide those services. And I'm always coming back with the same point, which is, um, okay, how much services do you want and how much are you willing to pay for that and how much uh, you want your converter to cost? And in, as I said, in some cases, those services, virtual inertia, are not valued um, in some project because we know that the grid is very strong there or that's not the point of that particular HVDC pro project. So in that case, there is no point going for a VSC with grid forming. So in that case, that, that opportunity cost is actually not that valuable. Whereas having a converter which is very efficient and extremely reliable is actually what is being seeked after. So in that case, the LCC makes sense. But it's, I'll say that the LCC in itself is very not able to provide these kind of services. But again, it's coming back to that point. How much do you, are you or is the network operator willing to pay for those services in the first place? And what we're seeing is that they're actually more and more willing to do so. Um, well, as I said, National Grid is having an active discussion with um, uh, with other grid operators, with uh, manufacturers of devices, both in HDC but also for with the generators, and with Academia in order to push uh, for payment of this kind of grid, uh, virtual synchronous grid uh, services, virtual inertia services, uh, because it is becoming very important. I'll take the example of that um, particular blackout that we had three years ago in the UK. One big learning that we had from that one is that the rock-off, which is the rate of change of frequency during that particular event was twice as much as it was 20 years ago, meaning that the frequency was dropping twice as fast as it was before. If you go back in the past or even go and talk to one of the retired power engineers from the time and tell them that the rock off was twice as much they would have had a heart attack straight away i don't recommend that that's not very nice to them um but they will be like no no that you can't operate a grid with that level of rock off it's like sorry that's exactly how the grid is operating nowadays thanks to the fact that we have these kind of services available uh but all that is a perpetual improvement process, and it's not something we could have moved in straight away as well. And the thing is that everything is pointing to the fact that the rock off will keep increasing, uh, the uh, inertia is, is going to keep decreasing as well, so we need to have the services in. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. And we have our last question from Diego Verdugo, who said, how did the short circuit fault at the DC capacitor of the MMC affects the balancing of the floating capacitors in the stacks? Ah, um, again, that's one of those. Um, it's in, a very, a very important aspect because um, we all, uh, even with very little knowledge in electronics, uh, um, we we know that if we have a capacitor which is short and you connect that to a short circuit it's usually not going to end up well. I mean, unless you're looking for fireworks, uh, but that's usually not going well. So the, the main thing with the, um, with the MMC is that you can, uh, you can actually disconnect those capacitors from the main conduction path using the fact that you have uh, IDBTs or, I mean, power trains, it could be IDBTs for high power or MOSFET for medium, uh, for medium power applications. Um, you essentially disconnect those capacitors, so they remain charged, but they're no longer in, in, the, in the circuit. So that's one thing you can do during your short circuit with a high bridge MMC. In the case of a full, full bridge MMC or the alternate amp converter or any other type of DC full blocking converters, you can actually actively 
turn the capacitor around in order to connect it the other way. And that will actually um, force the fog from stopping in the first place. Because essentially, like, instead of having a short circuit, now you're just providing, I mean, I'll say, just inverting capacitor, which you, you just end up with a short circuit, but you actually just control those capacitors to make sure that there is no voltage across that short circuit anymore. And that actually will shut down the, the current straight away. The alternative for that will be using a DC circuit breakers, which is now being demonstrated, but it's still something which is largely in development and, and not being seen everywhere. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Michael. Um, it was a very interesting presentation and discussion. Um, it's a, a great opportunity to our students and researchers also, and I'm sure um, will be an inspiration for many of us and future collaborations with you and you, your, your research team. Uh, and I take the opportunity to invite you to our third talk uh, on Friday, October 1st at 8.30 in uh, Santiago of Chile time to listen uh, to Professor Ricardo Aguilera from the University of uh, Technology Sydney who will talk about model predictive control in energy conversion. So oh, yeah. have a day. thank you very much, Michael, and uh, goodbye to everyone. All the best. Thank you very much. Bye.